If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And on this Sunday that we have a moment to review on Generational Sunday and kind of talk about the, one of the uniqueness of our church to have the generations, I want to point our attention to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and the joy of the generations. This is precisely one of the reasons why I love this church. We love, this church has been healthy for a long time because of its desire to take the gospel both locally amongst our city and amongst our community, but also to the nations. And one of the things that's kept us strong is we're not a church just filled with old people or just filled with young people, that we have a beautiful mix of the generations that are represented here today. And this morning it was represented as I looked out, I saw my dad uh, holding his granddaughter, my daughter, as we sang these songs together. And you look out and you see that multiplied throughout. And as you saw it represented here from our youth choir and children's choir, our senior adult joy singers and regular uh, sanctuary choir, just all singing together in one unison voice. There's something sweet about that. And so this morning, we wanted to call this Sunday Generational Sunday and kind of lean into the joy of the generations. And it's one of the the reasons why I just love this place so very much is the joy of the generations coming together with the singular purpose to lift high the name of Jesus. So I'm going to read the entirety of Deuteronomy 6 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get it out and you can follow along with me. There's a lot there. And so as I read, and again, I'm going to say it, the entire chapter of Deuteronomy 6. So don't get listening fatigue. Stay with me. There's a lot of good things here. Maybe you want to underline a few things and we'll go back to pretty much the wholeness of Deuteronomy 6. There's a lot here. I've got a short amount of time. So let's kick this thing into overdrive and let's get it done, all right? Let's do it together. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that you may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise." You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be on the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and with houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full... Verse 12 says, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God who you shall fear. Him you shall serve and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For the Lord your God in the midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from the face of the earth. Verse 16, and you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he commanded you. And you shall do what is good and what is good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you. And that you may go in and take possession of the good land the Lord God swore to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you as the Lord your God promised And when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household, right before our eyes. And he brought us out of there, and that he might bring us into And give us the land that he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are to this day. And this will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all the commandment before the Lord our God as he had commanded us. Let's pray it in our hearts. Lord, would you teach us? Allow our hearts to be open and receptive to all that your word will say today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. As you have your outlines, we've got a few truths that we want to unleash this morning. The first is we transfer what we treasure. Number one, we transfer what we treasure. The whole goal of what we'll see this morning as we pass on the gospel and teach the gospel to the next generation is that we, as a people, will transfer that which we treasure. And before we get to how we do this, it's important for us to recognize that we will not transfer those things that we do not treasure. You see in verses 2 and 5 that uh, the writer would say that you may fear the Lord your God, you and then your son and your son's sons. Then you go on to verse 5 and you see you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. As Jesus was asked, what is the first and greatest commandment? He said this precisely, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. First and foremost, friends, we will not pass on that which we do not have. Moms and dads and grandparents and teachers, if you're looking to pass on the gospel, you will not pass on that which you do not have. If the gospel has not been a priority in your heart, it's hard for that to be a priority in the heart of the children that will come after you. You will not, we will not pass on that which we do not treasure. When we found out that Micah was going to be born and we have so few uh, secrets or so few uh, surprises in life that when Micah was born, I wanted to find out the moment that the doctor found out what it was, a boy or a girl. So Micah was born and we celebrated a little boy born into our household and we were just glad for a healthy baby. And so we took him home and he was born in September. And so that Christmas came along and he's like four months old and we were going out to buy him some Christmas presents. And I wanted a little time for me to buy my son his first Christmas present from his dad. And we were getting him like diapers and clothes because he's four months old. He didn't have a clue what's going on. So we're getting him utility gifts that would pass as gifts, right? That's what we did. But there was one present that I wanted to be from from his dad, right? And so I did what any good dad would do. I got my boy Legos because I love Legos and I wanted him to enjoy Legos as much as I did. And he's four months old and so I didn't get him the Duplo. I got that boy a thousand piece Lego set that was meant for kids ages 12 and older. And Christmas came around and I set that little bundle of joy down. And as he slept, he watched his dad assemble that Lego set joyfully on that Christmas morning. Because I love Legos. I love them. As a 35-year-old guy, I'm not afraid to say I love Legos. And partner that with I love Star Wars. And so I got that boy Lego Star Wars. Two for one, right? And man, to this day, I love Legos getting on the floor, opening up that little instruction book and just sitting down for what feels like minutes and just assembling those little creations together. And I've instilled that joy of Legos with him where, where did Micah go? He's back there just building Legos, just loving building Legos. We love watching Star Wars Legos together because it's a love. It's something that I treasure and love is Star Wars. And so you see it building up in him. I mean, think about it this way. Do you Do you cheer for any sports teams? And do you see your kids rooting for many of those same teams that you're rooting for and cheering for? We treasure, we transfer those things that we treasure. In our households, what we celebrate or what we replicate is what we celebrate. And you see the writer of Deuteronomy saying, first and foremost, before we talk about passing on and teaching our children, first and foremost, you've got to have it in your heart. The gospel must affect your soul before we would intentionally pass it on to who would come next. Maybe you don't have kids right now and you're wondering how this plays and affects you, but the Lord has put people on your pathway, whether it's grandchildren, whether it's the next generation that you are discipling, whether it's you're a high schooler and you're discipling junior high students, whether you're a junior high student and you're discipling who comes after you, maybe there's people in your classroom or people on your job site that you can intentionally disciple. So let's then ask the question, how do we pass along this gospel that has been entrusted to us? Tomorrow I leave for seven days to go to Ghana. Uh, We're going to Commission us here in just a moment, but I'm, I'm going away. And 
next Sunday morning. I'm so delighted that Jay will be filling the pulpit. It's the first time on a Sunday morning for him to preach and to prepare the pulpit for Jay. I thought it would only be fitting to, to do an acrostic. It's not one of my strong suits, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot because uh, Jay is so good at those and has taught us so well. And so I'm gonna give you an acrostic and that acrostic is taste. Coming from Psalm 34, eight, taste and see that the Lord is good. So let me give you an acrostic, taste, to help us understand with practical application how we can pass on this gospel to the next generation. As I was talking about an acrostic for this morning, uh, a staff member misheard me and thought that I was gonna do the acrostic generational. And they began to get very concerned about the length of the, of the sermon with 12, uh, 12 to hit. But this morning, we just have five tastes. So let's start with the T, which is teach. Teach. How do we pass on this gospel to the next generation? First and foremost, the T is for teach. If you look on your, in your scripture at verse seven, go back one more, in verse six, it says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Now, I want you to circle and underline the word diligently because I think we would all agree that we should be teaching our children and grandchildren, that we should be intentionally teaching the next generation gospel principles. But go a step further and see what the writer says here with the word diligently. And let me ask you as parents, as grandparents, as teachers in the room, what does the word diligently mean to you when instructing your children? What does it mean for us to teach the gospel truths to our children diligently? We know that studies would tell us that kids that are 8 to 12 years old spend 4 to 6 hours on screens every day with teenagers spending upwards of 9 hours a day on screens. We recognize that as adults, sometimes we can get home from a long day at work and we can sit in a, a chair and we can watch TV until we fall asleep and we can be trained and taught by so many avenues outside of scripture. Our children are being taught by culture, by media, by social media. They are being uh, just constant onslaught of teaching. And so for us, what does it mean as mom and dad, as grandparent, as discipler, What does it mean for us to teach them diligently? Does it mean coming into church once a month and dragging them in and then leaving and never talking about scripture, never talking about faith or anything the rest of the time? Knowing that they are constantly berated by all that's happening in media and culture and social media, constantly being taught on a consistent basis. What does it mean for us, mom and dad, to teach with diligence? What does it mean for us to teach with diligent in a systematic, in a consistent way that we would teach the next generation what it means to follow Jesus, what it means, what the gospel stories about sin and obedience that we would teach with diligence? So first we teach, the second is ask. The A is ask. When you get to verse 20, you see, when your son asks you in the time to come, Mom and dad, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? And then you shall say to your son, how neat is it in the midst of this story that the writer was already preparing the moms and dads to say, when your son, when your children come to you and say, hey, mom and dad, why do we celebrate the Passover? Hey, hey, mom and dad, what's up with all these rules and these things that we do? What's up with all this? Don't you think that that mom and dad said, hold on, I, I've got a story to tell you. Oh, hey, sit down. Hey, hey, let's get the fire going. Let me tell you a story. Hey, one time, my mom and dad, they were in Egypt and they were in captivity. And let me tell you, all of a sudden, plagues came down. And, and my parents, they saw it. They told us about it. And then we walked across on dry land as God parted the Red Sea. Hey, and can you imagine the joy in mom and dad's face when their kids said, hey, why do we celebrate the Passover? Can you imagine just the joy welling up in them and say, let me tell you, every step of the way, the good things that we've heard and experienced. Those questions are pretty powerful. And can't you imagine the joy in mom and dad to just get to say, let me tell you the story of God's faithfulness to our family. 
our, our household right now, our minivan is filled with questions. I mean, just nonstop. Why this? Why this? Why are we stopping? How long until we get there? What's going on? Why is there a rainbow? Why is it raining? Why is it not raining? Why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? Why can't I have a hamburger? Why can't I have a cookie? Just nonstop questions. I mean, to the point that it is exhausting. But at the same time, that's, that's how they're learning. They're asking questions. They want to understand and make sense of the world that they're living in. Moms and dads, grandparents, those who are discipling and training people who are coming up after you. There may be a day that your kids come and ask questions. Mom and dad, why do we do this? Grandma, granddad, why do you go over and serve over there? Mom and dad, why are we doing this? Mom and dad, what does it mean when you put that little envelope in the offering plate every week? Mom and dad, what does it mean when we're doing this? Mom and dad, why, why don't we do this like everybody else around me does? Why Everybody at school does this. Why don't we do that? But see, in that would be incumbent on us for our lives and our households to look a little bit different than everybody else's around them. It was sweet this week as I was telling Micah that I was going to Ghana and filling up suitcases and getting prepared. With a sweetness in his voice, he just said, Dad, why are you going to Ghana? In a moment, I was just like, I'm just going, but the Lord slowed me down in light of this message to say, hey, hey buddy, let me tell you. Do you know how we have that caring center at our church? you know how we have uh, the opportunities to tell people about Jesus in our city? Hey, buddy, do you know that there's people all across the face of this planet that don't know Jesus. So I'm, I'm gonna go tell people about Jesus over there. When those questions come up, whether it's to an eighth grader or an eight-year-old or whether it's to a 38-year-old or a 48 or an 88-year-old, when those questions come up, we don't discount and disregard. We get on their level and we begin to walk with them. Questions are good. And you see in verse 20, when your son asks you in the time to come, Mom and dad, have you ever been baptized before? Grandmama, granddaddy, ha have you ever walked forward in church? Have you ever been on a mission trip? Grandmama and granddaddy, what does it mean for you to follow Jesus? What will your response be? Questions are good. And I can imagine that family sitting around and as that son asked, what is the meaning of the testimonies? Why are we a little different? That that mom and dad joyfully swelled up and said, let me tell you a story. And so we go from teach, to ask, to the S is for C. The S is for C, S-E-E. -E. In verse 8, uh, we're going to hurry on through this, so stay with me here. The S is for C. And you see that he said, when you, you put them on the, bind them on the frontlets between your eyes, write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates so that you see the gospel message, you see the stories and scriptures everywhere that you go. You're seeing it often. But they also need to see it lived out amongst us. Can I tell you one of the most compelling things for the next generation to see is a generation that is sold out for Jesus. One of the most compelling reasons to follow Jesus is to see a generation who is compellingly sold out for Jesus. And one of the most discouraging things for the next generation to see is a generation that gives lip service to the gospel but lives their lives like it is little to no consequence. Let me say that again. One of the most compelling things for the next generation to see is a generation above them who is completely sold out for the gospel. It is compelling. But one of the most discouraging things for the next generation to see is a generation above them who gives lip service to the gospel but walks out like it lives little to no consequence for their life. The next generation needs to see it lived out. And the next T is for talk. You see in verse 7 again, it says, you shall teach them diligently to the children and you shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Essentially, you should talk about it all the time. The vernacular of your home should be conversations about spiritual things. The vernacular of your day in and day out life as you go to work and home and families is to talk about what Jesus means to you and talk about scripture. This is why we as a church give you the scripture memory so that in your home, you have a first step to doing spiritual things in your home. 
that in your home you're reciting the scripture together, you're talking about scriptural things together, you're praying together, and you're talking about what God is doing in your life together. We talk about it. When we get up in the morning, when we go to bed at night, and everywhere in between, we're talking about what Jesus is doing in our lives. So often, we pick up our Bibles on the way to church. We talk about sports and families and jobs and grades and extracurriculars. And at some point, we neglect to talk about the weighty spiritual things in our homes. And so you see the writer tells us, how do we pass on this great commandment? We talk about it often. It's normal and natural vernacular in your home is to talk about spiritual things with your mom and your dad and your grandparents and the people who are being discipled. And lastly, the E is for experience. Let them experience the faith alongside you. Let them experience faith and let them experience the difficulties of life alongside you. As I was trying to figure out how to explain this and wrap all this nightly in a bow, I began to think about how we disciple and train to drive. Activate in your mind how, how you were taught how to drive a car. I began thinking about this week how I was teaching and preparing my three kids for driving. It doesn't happen when they turn 14 and we go into an empty and abandoned parking lot and we say, all right, buddy, you got the wheel. I'm going to stay over here and I got the wheel just in case something happens. It starts right now. It starts with I drive Micah to school every day and he watches me. Am I on my cell phone talking? And do I have the phone up watching sports centers? I'm driving to work. Am I yelling at everybody around me? Am I lowering my window down and holding up my hands and yelling at people? And just, is he seeing me do this every single day? This is how I teach my son and my kids, my, my girls, how to drive a car. Every day, they're watching their dad drive a car. It doesn't happen one day to say, hey, Micah, come in the car. I'm going to show you as a six-year-old exactly how to drive. And so here's how it works, buddy. I'm about 10 and 2. Turn off the radio. Turn off the phone. The phone's down on by the dash in airplane mode. I'm driving the car. Hey, buddy, this is how it's done. Are you watching everything that I'm doing? And then the next day, as he gets in the car, put the phone on the dash, watching Sports Center, taking calls, yelling at people, uh, the two don't compute. Because there's going to be one day, he turns 14, and we go into that abandoned parking lot. He gets in the driver's seat. He turns on the car, and I'm in that passenger seat. And there's no cars around, nothing going on, and I'm helping him navigate all the obstacles that are out there, how to push the accelerator, how to hit on the brake, how to come to a stop, how to turn on the blinker. We're walking through everything. And there's a day comes that he turns 15 and then he gets that permit and we get in the car together and we begin to go on the roads and I begin to, you know, slam on the fake brake on my side and at times grab the wheel and encourage him in every step of the way. Because there comes a day that he turns 16. And on that day, I'll open the door and I'll hand him the keys, and I'll shut the door, and all I can do is pray. Because for 16 years, he's watched every portion of every day getting in the car, driving places, different places. And on that day, if I said, hey, Micah, buddy, you're 16 now, do not talk on the phone, do not do all this, be careful of your surroundings, be calm, don't yell at people, turn on your blinkers. And for 16 years, if he watched his dad and his mom do the opposite of everything that I said, how impactful would it be if he got in that car to say, you know what, I saw my dad drive with the dash on, I saw my dad take calls, I saw my dad yell at people. Friends, they need to experience it with you. There's going to be a day that they need to get out in the parking lot and drive with nobody around. There's going to be a day that they need their permit and they need to take a little ownership. And there's going to be a day, whether it's you send them off to college, whether it's you send them off to their first job, whether it's you put the keys in their hands and you say go. There's going to be a day where the kids that are in our nursery right now are being sent out to be the next missionaries and teachers and doctors and lawyers and engineers and nurses. It's going to be a day that these kids who sang right here will one day go out and make disciples of all nations. And so how are we going to train and disciple and teach? 
Some would say maybe in this room, man, I have failed so hard. I've been 15 years of watching Sports Center and listening and taking calls and yelling at everybody around me. I have failed. That ship has sailed, and I gotta, I guess I'll try as a granddad one day. There's an old proverb that the best time to plant a tr tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. It's easy to say I failed, there's nothing else I can do, or it's to say, you know what? I may never, never sit under that shade, but I'm gonna plant that tree today. You may have failed as a mom or a dad, you may have not done well, but the greatest time to start living it up is today. I can tell you from this, I am gonna be a better father today than I was yesterday. As we come to this, recognize, as we teach diligently, as we allow our children to ask questions and as we answer, as we allow them to see us living for Jesus, as we talk about it and as we experience it. Friends, we're raising up the next generation who will follow Jesus faithfully to the ends of the earth. Here's the deal, I've run out of time and you've still got three blanks and I know that I'm not gonna leave you with blanks without filled in. So I'm gonna give you the blanks and then let you do your own research at home, okay? So number three, be careful in our contentment. Look at verse 12 and look at the contentment of the nation as they get into the promised land, the peril and prosperity and being content. And then the last on your outline is how good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity, young and old, as we sing together for the glory of God, how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. Let me pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the joy of talking and learning and growing together. Lord, I pray as we, as moms and dads, as grandparents, but also those who are discipling the next generation, those who have a voice towards the next generation, those who've, who've come before us, Lord, I pray that there is much that we have to learn. So I pray we're always in process of being poured into and also pouring out to others as we taste and see that you are good. Teach us, Lord, to walk according to your way and your plan. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.